It's great to be able to be here uh, back at the Board of Trade. Uh, it's great to be able to have an opportunity to share with you what we are thinking about as the Conservative Party of British Columbia for everyone in this province. When I think about British Columbia, I think about a province that has all the hope and potential we could ever hope for. It has all the resources we could ever want. It has a great, uh, well-educated population, but unfortunately, it's hopelessly managed. We just can't get things actually happening in British Columbia. You know, we talked about um, the mining sector, I just heard about that there, and I just, you know, we have 17 mines that are either currently about to be permitted uh, or ready to go in this province. Those 17 mines would represent between 20 and 30,000 jobs at an average wage and benefit of 138,000 a year and would add close to 800 billion to British Columbia's GDP. And if all those mines, if we could get them up and running, the revenues for, from those mines alone would go a significant way to being able to actually reduce that massive deficit, the record deficit we have in British Columbia. And I think, you know, when I think about the fact that one in three people are thinking about leaving this province, that one in two youth are thinking about leaving British Columbia, I do look at it and think, okay, why are people leaving? They can't see the hope for the future. They can't afford, you know, they're struggling to afford to be able to put food and, on the table and to pay their rent. Um, they can't dream of owning a home. They're seeing, you know, all of the problems of crime and drugs in our street, <clears throat> the crisis that we have in our health care, and so much more. It's no wonder why people are thinking, why, why would I stay here if I can't build a future in British Columbia? So when you talk about the business environment and the problem attracting the people that they want to be working, it's no wonder that people are struggling to be able to find those people when this is the attitude that, that is happening out there. We had, uh, as was referenced, we had record number of people leaving British Columbia last year, 72,500. Last time it was that high, I think it was 1998, it was just over 60,000. So uh, uh, clearly, you know, people are voting with their feet in terms of what we need to be doing. And I get it, because after seven years of our current government, you know, can anybody point to anything and say it's better? Uh, because it's not. There's problems everywhere. So as the Conservative Party, we want to be able to return hope for people in British Columbia. We want to make sure that people can fulfill that dream of what British Columbia needs to be. Forest sector, for example, we are the highest cost producers Two-thirds of the forest sector has been decimated uh, under the current government. We need to get the feet back underneath our forest sector. When you've got a company like Canfor that used to be about 84% of its products being produced in British Columbia, now is about 12% of its products, and it's looking at exiting entirely out of British Columbia. This was its home. This is where it built its future. This is where people depended on it. Lives and communities depended on that forest sector, and it is leaving because it can't do business in British Columbia. We haven't been able to resolve the trade issues with the Americans. We haven't been able to, you know, even get to a place where we can provide logs to mills. Up in the, up in the peace country, one of the mills that was shut down, it takes 3.2 years on average to get a permit. There is places in this province where, for example, BC timber sales is not putting out any volume in the last three years. We've got places that have been impacted by wildfires, whereas if it's on the Alberta side of the border, Within three weeks, they've got permits, they're going in, they're harvesting, they're doing the site prep, they're doing the, the planting, they're getting stuff back and a healthy forest growing. And over here, it's taken three years and maybe you get three or four permits. And mills, in the meantime, are going up and down because they can't get the wood. This has to change. We've got to cut this red tape out of this. We've got to get to a place where we can actually see businesses operating in this province. So it's going to be a high priority for the Conservative Party of British Columbia to get these things going, to get our minds going get the feeding back underneath our forest sector. And when it comes to our natural gas sector, <clears throat> we need to be able to export our natural gas. And I focus on all this, not just because, you know, this is the Board of Trade and there's all the economic activity that's needed, but if we're going to solve the problems of health care, if we're going to solve the problems of addictions, if we're going to solve the problems that we have in this province, we need the revenues. We need to see a strong economy to be able to count on it because we cannot do this with more taxation. So we need to remove some of those restrictions and barriers that are in place. For example, the restriction of using or, I mean, electricity for compression on LNG. That doesn't make any sense. It cannot happen. We'll see no projects move forward in this project, no large-scale projects move forward with that because it is too costly. We need to be thinking as well about how we actually provide that electricity in terms of our future. Right now, yeah, last year, I think it was 17%, close to 20% of the electricity we consumed was from outside of our border. How is that 
you know, what we need to be doing for British Columbians so that we have that reliable power, whether it's for industry, even for things like uh, natural gas that does, does need to see, have auxiliary power as part of it, uh, or whether it's new businesses that want to start up. If you don't have reliable power, what are you going to do? And so this is why we also have to have a very significant focus on generating the electricity we need. We need to get rid of things like the mandates for heat pumps and electric vehicles because we don't have the electricity to actually fulfill those. If we were to go ahead and every home and every business like this had to use heat pumps in the province of British Columbia, you would need to build the equivalent of six or seven more Site C dams. We're likely never going to build another major dam in this province. So it's not possible to meet those targets without doing that significant investment. And so we have a significant plan for doing that, for generating the power that we need. And that means we're going to have a conversation about nuclear power. Should we have that as part of our mix in British Columbia? But I look at everything you know, from that perspective as well of how do we address those immediate needs as well for businesses. So we need the power. We need to make sure we get the, the red tape out of the way. We have to do uh, the, what we can do on the tax side to make businesses be able to be able to come and invest here. We've got to make sure that they can do it in a timely way. But we need to make sure we've got the workers. Because at the end of the day, businesses aren't really the focus from my perspective. It's the workers. We need to make sure if we're going to address affordability, we have to have the lightest touch we can as government in terms of taxation, which is why we introduce things like the rest ad rebate, which is why we're going to cut things like the carbon tax. But we need to make sure that we can drive wage growth. And you can't have wage growth if you don't have profitable businesses, if you don't have a strong economy. So we're going to be very focused on actually making sure that we get those tools and those pieces in place so that we can see that growth. And when it comes to making sure that we have the workers in British Columbia, yes, we've got a challenge with immigration. Too many workers are coming into this province and not being able to get directly in the workforce. We need to work on how we focus on the training, both the training that they've received outside of the country as well as the training they have in here. But I think more importantly, we actually shouldn't be relying on Ottawa 3,000 miles away making those decisions on immigration. We should take control of immigration right here in British Columbia and make sure that we can set our own future, make sure that we can have the people coming in and we work with foreign training institutions, make sure when they come in, they can come directly into our workforce. So we can do things like have the forces we need for building housing, having the workforces we need to be able to support the restaurant industry, having those people coming in to be able to deal with health and, and uh, uh, the other issues, other uh, components that we need in our economy. But the last topic, of course, I want to touch on is, you know, so many businesses I hear about are struggling because of crime uh, and uh, also with uh, addictions and mental health. This is, a, this is a very serious issue. When you have to have, you know, a company, for example, like Savon, that's hired 345 security people just because they're worried about their staff in their buildings and the amount of, of goods that are walking out the door. And people are not, there's no consequences for these people, for these prolific offenders that are continually committing these crimes. Just think about how much money that is for a company like that that has to be passed on to the cost of our food because we are not addressing crime. So we need to have a significant focus on doing that, making sure that these prolific offenders, uh, that there's consequences for that. We're going to be doing that within our current system, within what we can control, which is the justice system, making sure that we get through that. We're going to be pushing the federal government for guaranteed minimum sentencing. We've got to make sure that we get these people off our streets so that it's safer. And I'll close just with talking a little bit about addictions. Across this province, uh, the number of people that have died from overdoses is, is just shocking. When you talk to a mom whose child has lost his life to an addiction and who fought within the system, fought to try to get help and was not able to get help, that to me is a failure of government. We need to make sure we do everything we can to have a path to get people healthy, to give them an opportunity to recover, to give them an opportunity to be able to build their lives. That means we need to be able to support parents and parents' rights, to be able to work and be able to provide for the children. But most importantly, as a government, we need to make sure that we build out the recovery that's needed in this province to address this. If we can do this, if we can address the addictions, if we can address the crime, if we can lower the burdens that we have within government to be able to unleash our economic potential, I think, quite frankly, people will be once again to be proud to be British Columbian, and we'll see this, this province on a very different path. That's the vision for a Conservative Party, just to deliver common sense change for everyone here in British Columbia. Thank you. The middle chair, thanks.
Thanks very much, John. I'll just remind everybody that they can join the conversation by um, logging onto slido.com. Uh, you started off talking about the immediate needs of business, but also the need for revenues. And so uh, knowing what we know about your platform right now, a couple of significant cuts and incentives, uh, eliminating the carbon tax, which is about $3 billion in revenue, uh, your rent and mortgage rebate, which is about 3000 a month. So given these kinds of cuts and incentives, where do you think the impacts are going to be felt on other government services when you talk about need for health care and for some of the other um, government spends that need to be made? Sure. So obviously, um, there's significant impacts there. When I talk about actually getting rid of the carbon tax, it's not just the carbon tax. We're also going to get rid of the low carbon fuel emission standard. And what that means is about 35 and a half cents, according to the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, in terms of savings for everyday uh, people, as well, of course, as for the businesses. And we saw, all saw the challenges of transportation, waiting uh, in parking lots along Highway 1 and other places in terms of getting back and forth. That'll be a huge savings for people in terms of that fine. But how do we pay for it is the question. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, um, one of the reasons why we're not accelerating and doing, our, doing the tax relief immediately is we have a fiscal fiscally irresponsible government. They've dug a huge hole, and I don't want to put us into a further burden. So we've got to find that right balance of providing immediate relief uh, and relief that will increase over time as we grow the economy and reduce that deficit. Now, we're also going to need to look at some things that uh, government is spending on. For example, Clean BC. Um, and a lot of that sort of stuff just doesn't make sense. We're going to need to find ways to be able to look at that money and, <clears throat> and reallocate that money towards reducing def the debt and uh, reducing our deficits, to say, and making sure that we're protecting the services. Healthcare is going to expand in terms of funding. It has to expand. We're going to continue on with doing that. But we are going to be looking for savings. And I think a government that has... What does that, that has, mean, looking for savings, though? Well, uh, so a government that has increased its budget by 70% over seven years, and a pub public service that has grown by almost 50% over that same period of time, and yet I don't think anybody can point to anything that's better. We need to be looking at just where that money is being spent. We need to be, res be respectful of taxpayers' money and making sure that we're delivering those services as effectively as possible. Are you anticipating there will be cuts in service, though, as you are trying to tackle the deficit? Uh, I'm not anticipating uh, you know, cuts, certainly, in the mainline services. I want to look at uh, many of the sort of pet projects that this government has put in place, uh, things like Clean BC, places where we can actually look and say, is there, uh, it, do those need to be done? Can we do that more efficiently? Can we make sure that there are the savings? But ultimately, you can't solve a $9 billion deficit with, with tax or I mean, reduction of services. That would be just devastating services. You can't do that. You need to grow the economy. And that's why we're going to be so focused on making sure we get government out of the way and get our economy growing in BC. How long under a BC Conservative government do you think it would take you to eliminate the deficit to balance the budget again? Uh, I'm anticipating that if we can get the mines up and running, if we can move forward and see phase two for LNG Canada and other potential projects going, if we can get the feet back under our fourth sector, if we can make sure that the, the tech sector can thrive and have the people staying here in British Columbia as well as the other businesses, I actually think that we would be in a strong position by the end of a second term to actually be in a surplus. End of a second term. But it's not possible to do it in one term. And I, you know, I'm not going to be... I've just got to be straight up with people. It's just not a viable option to be able to do that. We can't grow the economy fast enough. Uh, I'm going to get to a couple of questions there, um, but I do want to ask you um, about a couple of other things. Um, so I want to ask you about uh, Indigenous reconciliation because I would like some clarity. You supported UNDRIP in 2019. Uh, you talked about previously about repealing it, and it sounds like things are shifting again. So I'll give you the opportunity to... Uh, explain your position on this. Sure. So <clears throat> when I was minister, I mean, I signed 435 agreements with First Nations, and I, I fully understand that economic reconciliation is the path to go. I remember when I was minister and the business sector would come in and talk to Christy Clark, uh, our former premier, and, and they would be saying, please double John's budget, because the work with Indigenous communities is the most critical work that we need to do in this province. But we need to make sure that it's focused on getting our economy going and thriving. Because the difference that you make in a, in a First Nation community is remarkable. When you see you know, a First Nation get engaged in the economy, when you see the people having jobs and you see that hope for the future, 
the difference that has made for that for those people is remarkable, and it's for the benefit of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. Did you change your position on this? No, we haven't changed our position on it. Mm -hmm. Our position is, is really straightforward. We will continue to use UNDRIP in the way that the United Nations intended it to be. When you go back and look at the debates on, from the United Nations, it's meant to be a guiding principle to guide governments in how they work and respect First Nations, which is what we will do. But when we look at legislative approaches that create barriers, that create problems, uh, that is not going to create reconciliation. That's going to create frustrations. And so we're looking at that from a perspective of if it's in the way, then we need to remove it, we need, but we need to replace it with the right approach and the right sort of legislation in BC. But let, if, I, if I can take a minute, uh, and I know I'm eating up time, I'm sorry, but I want to just talk about why this makes such a difference. There was a, a young lady in my riding, um, and she was living on the street, and she uh, had a child, and she couldn't provide for a child. Through economic opportunities, through the idea of getting some training in place, she came in, she was able to get some training, she got her first job. And she came to me, and she gave me a meat offering to say thank you, because now she could provide for her child. Now she wasn't living on the street, and she was back getting additional training, and she already had another job to go to. That's the difference we need to make for people across this province, especially for Indigenous communities. There's a question about uh, our competitiveness in British Columbia and a specific question about reducing taxes uh, for businesses. Can you speak to that? Yeah, there's no question when you look at the burden for businesses, uh, the tax burden is, is crazy, but the tax is only one component of it. It's the fact that it's all the regulations in place, it's all the hoops you have to go through, it's all the reporting that has to be in place. It makes it almost impossible to be able to do businesses in this, in this province. But the specifically, would you reduce taxes for businesses? So we are looking at all the ways to be able to reduce the cost structure. Certainly from an administrative perspective, all those components, but I am looking at additional tax relief and the tax that need to be put in there, and we're going to be announcing some steps uh, in the coming days. On the flip side, I do have to ask you, because you said uh, sometime in the last week that you wouldn't increase taxes without a referendum. Correct. I'd like to know who would like to vote for a tax increase, number one. <laughs> Everybody put up their hand. <laughs> yeah. Why would you take that position? Uh, because... When does it I've, not put you in a corner? It does put you, uh, government in a corner, but I actually think government needs to be held accountable. Right now, governments of all stripes have been treating people in, in this province as a, as a piggy bank. And whenever their ir fiscal irresponsible policies are being put in place, they just go and ask for money. We've had, what, 33 different increases in new taxes in British Columbia. Um, we need to say enough is enough. So we need to make sure that we have the right revenues being able to come in. We need to grow our economy to increase those revenues, but we cannot be continually going back to people and asking for money unless there's a good case to be made. And governments can do that. But my perspective is we need to be able to find might a path forward. Might remind you of the, e the HST. I just might remind you about that. That didn't really go that well for the, the BC. My levels. writing voted for it. A uh, couple of questions, and then we'll be out of time, but a question specifically on the employer health tax. And again, the NDP government did um, increase the threshold, which provided some relief for businesses. Uh, it wasn't fully what the business community was asking for. Is this something that you would consider making changes to? You know, we're going to look at all components that are added to the cost of businesses. And the, the government removed MSP and created the employer health tax. All they did was just transfer the tax and then that just gets passed on to consumers anyway. It got hidden. And I want to look at it from a perspective of can we remove it? I would like to be in a position to remove it, but in order to do that, that would be about $2.4 billion. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to look at it from a perspective, what is the best way to be able to support our economy and people and making sure that uh, people can afford to live here? And right now, we don't have the tax room to be able to adjust it. I want a final, uh, final question and finish off with um a question more about the, some of the core beliefs of the BC Conservative Party that some of our members have expressed concerns about, whether it's SOGI or climate change or COVID vaccines. You know, what can the business community expect, um, given the balance of that and the social beliefs and the core values from a BC Conservative Party if elected? Well, I can tell you what you'll see from a Conservative government, should we have that on a reforming government, is a government that's going to be laser focused on making sure we get our economy going, on making sure that people can afford to live here. And somebody once asked me, how would you define success of a conservative government? And I would say this, four years from now, instead of one in two youth wanting to leave this province, that they're optimistic about building future and that other youth are coming to British Columbia to be able to build a future. But that what would you say to those people that have addressed concerns about some of the social issues then? 
Well, I can tell you that our agenda has been very clear, everything that we are doing as a, as a party. And we have candidates that have a variety of views, and I'm okay with that. A variety of views is okay. Unlike the NDP, I actually don't mind a variety of views, but as a Conservative Party, the agenda that we move forward is very clear in terms of what we're going to be doing to improve lives and to bring back common sense in British Columbia. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.